Welcome back, Geely Pro Scholars. We are diving into part two of our conversation with Mrs. Sequita Jackson Russell. Now, as a therapist, Sequita has had a very interesting journey from undergrad to master's to getting her licensing, and our conversation dives right into that part. And she also explains what can you do with a psychology degree. Now, we also want to tap into entrepreneurship and therapy being balanced as a therapist, the differences between psychology and psychiatry, also advice for starting a master's program in psychology, and just overall studying to become a therapist. We also tap into the importance of being balanced in nature and how it all applies to you being a better human being, thinking clearly. Let's get back into it. If you're if you if you want to talk to the next generation, um, what are some of the things that they should be like if they're studying psychology right now in undergrad? What are some of the things that they should take seriously? Like, is it you know the research component of it? I mean, I, of course you take everything seriously in, in college, but like, what are some of the things that you know like this is going to carry with you throughout your your journey of getting your licensing and you know all the, the different titles and everything like that. Absolutely. What I would like to suggest or recommend is to think about where you see yourself going, right? And then take some steps back on what it will then take to get to that very place. So just an example, like forensic psychology, right? And we think about, oh, okay, what does it take to then get there? And you backtrack and look at the steps to then take toward achieving that very goal. Because my area is, I, I'm a licensed professional counselor. So what it took to get to where I am, I had to go to undergrad, of course, I went to grad school. And then what I then had to do is to take an examination, the, the national counseling exam. And then I had to do 3,500 hours um, as a clinician under a fully licensed clinician. Once I got that, I then had to apply for my full licensure, right? So now I'm then able to supervise and to cultivate the essence of those that are coming after me. Wow. So you may be lucky enough to get a free supervisor to support those clinical hours, but you may then have to pay for them. So you would then want to kind of budget that into your facting in and weighing out the pros and cons of which direction you want to go in. So like you said, there's several different licensures, there's several different areas of focus, there's family counseling, there's, you know, couples counseling specifically, there's individual, there's groups, you know, so there are several different approaches to then take. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> It's not an easy rodeo. It's something that I think is, um, very rewarding in the end when you think about all oh, that I've invested all I've put in yeah. you may have some tears you may have some sweat perhaps a little blood you know <laughs> with the idea not not really but you know just with the idea of all that goes into mm -hmm. just really you know taking full advantage of opportunities in addition to achieving the goal that you set for yourself you know what it wasn't just until now when you mentioned Mr. Stanzak's class we took <laughs> we took the anthropology class together Yes. That was the first time, well, this is the first time I'm realizing just how balanced you have to be as a therapist or in, in the psychology field. Um, and I want to touch on this because I want you to help us understand as a frontline worker in a pandemic, because you are considered a frontline worker. And the fact that mental health, even before the pandemic, with the rise of Black Lives Matter, and we're, we're still having this conversation in our nation about the fact that Black Lives Matter, you know, just yeah. society in general, you all wear a hat where, how do you not allow this to affect your life? You know, how do you balance mm -hmm. this? How do you offload the things that you are listening to through your clients and yeah. studying, you know, because yeah. this is not a new thing. We're just repeating history. It's just, we're dealing with it in a different way. So how in the world <laughs> do you balance yourself? Like, what are some of the things that you have practiced or have grown accustomed to doing to say, you know what, I have to take care of me too. Very, very important. And to be, you know, fully open and transparent at times that is difficult, you know, and it's something that you then have to remind yourself of, at least that's what I do. You know, I'm a big, 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 big fan of the idea of grounding and centering. 
right? So I would go outside, get some sunlight. I'll walk barefoot in the grass or even on the concrete, you know, look up to the sun, allow that to penetrate my skin in a way, right? Practice the idea of mindfulness and stretching and breathing. You know, those, you know, things that I encourage my clients to do, I then incorporate that into my own life. And I disengage, right? I decompress in a way. I cook. I watch my British cooking shows, you know, different things. To, you know, yes, she does. I love them. <laughs> Absolutely love them. Um, and next week, I'm taking the whole week off, right? Because I need that time to reset, to ground myself, to incorporate a lot of self-care. Because sometimes the days get away from you and, you know, it's like, oh, the weight of it. It's like, no, I have to let it go in a healthy way. So this is something that I've planned. And I'm then being intentional with this, you know, a lot of time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I think we can adopt those practices to us normal folk that are <laughs> that aren't in the industry. Because <laughs> that's a lot, man. And I have a new appreciation for therapy. I really do. Because I, I was... I, I remember telling you when we were in college, like psychology is just one of those things where you, how do you study the human mind and people's behaviors and not go crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. It gets your wheels turning, really. It's just like, okay. And not even to go into the whole notion of, or not at least in a great length of detail, uh, trauma, you know, and how that impacts a person and even drugs, you know, really thinking about how it changes, you know, the functionality in the, um, the, the, the brain, the chemistry, right? And yeah. it's just like, okay, it makes you really think about the decisions that could be life lasting and altering in a way, right? So even parenting is something that I have, you know, honed in, you know, as well, because I think it's very important to try to be very preventive, not just to work on the the, the opposing side of like fixing and working through past experiences, but how do we then approach things in a different way, in a more healthier way? Yep. So therapist, well, let's, let's start with the, the top list. <laughs> Woman of God, <laughs> wife, mother, therapist, and you're an entrepreneur. So let's, let's lead into this. And she's a sister. She's, she's an older sister, the oldest of her siblings. Older siblings always carry a different weight. I just had to throw that in here. But these are just so many of the different hats that you wear. But let's get into the entrepreneurial spirit that is being invigorated right now in your life. Because I think a lot of people get ambitious about a business in the beginning. But sometimes you have to take your hands off of it, come back to it. And when you come back to it, you have a lot more to pour into it so you can keep going. So it's okay to take that break. You know, you don't have to have the, the billion dollar idea work out at the first, you know, the first go round. So talk about how you are now incorporating um, entrepreneurship into your goals as a therapist. Therapist, you are in essence a business. You as a person, the service that you're then providing, right? And as an independent clinician, the opportunities are then endless, right? Because you have several different opportunities. And with myself, I like that idea of a holistic approach in addition to perhaps a, um, a medically, you know, influenced treatment plan as well, right? Because we think about what works for the client. Everybody's treatment plan is different and tailored to their specific needs, right? And for myself, you know, I've kind of divvied into the idea of different types of, you know, kind of um, practices and regimens and even tools to incorporate. So you, you would see Sage if you visited my, you know, Instagram page, you know, I'm really thinking about, and I, and I want to take a step back even with that particular practice. It's a Native American practice to kind of, you know, allow for the energy to um, be created a more positive, you know, energized environment, if you will. So with that, I learned in a multicultural class, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. something that was just kind of thought of out of thin air. It's like, okay, we think about culture. We think about the experience of others, how to then be then mindful and respectful of someone else's journey and what to then incorporate as a, a benefit, right? Or something that's beneficial, if you will. So I just thought I would share that with others. I'm not limiting my entrepreneurial endeavors to that. So there's several different things brewing. I'm not gonna talk, touch on today, <laughs> to it being in some of the earlier stages. And then next week, a part of my, you know, kind of prioritizing, compartmentalizing my, my smart goal plan, right, for that particular week, I am focusing a lot on the business, the entrepreneurial side of what I do during that time, so I'm pretty pumped about that. It sounds like you practice what you preach, so. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> let's do it. 
it's and that's that's the authenticity that's required when you're a therapist like you can't just be telling people be centered and balanced and your brain is going a thousand miles per hour so it, it, it definitely takes a special type of anointing to be a therapist and i i can't i can't over i can over appreciate you guys like i just love the fact that we have a new sense of appreciation for our frontline workers that's not just doctors or nurses but it's also mental health um experts like you guys are studying our behaviors i don't think people realize how important that is so <laughs> more power to you i totally like i say over appreciate the the things that you are doing in our community to help me understand the different types of jobs that you can get with a psychology because you graduated undergrad with a psychology degree correct okay psychology degree and then when you get to grad schools when you really want to think about your area of focus really okay and you can do that by way of undergrad as well because you can of course major minor right um so with your graduate degree that's a little bit more i think tailored or specific to where you see yourself in your career right or somewhere along the path so mm -hmm. i have my um master's in counseling psychology and that is more so you know toward or um you know kind of i think more so tailored to what i do currently it is right because that was a part of the the requirement to become a licensed professional counselor, but you can go into school psychology, you can focus on children specifically, um, you can think about several different areas of expertise. Um, if you want to go into, which I will eventually, um, to obtain a doctorate, right, so that will be your PsyD, or if you want to go into psychiatry, which then the difference between what I do in psychiatry is that you could then prescribe medications, right? Okay. So I work a alongside a lot of psychiatrists so that I'm doing the therapy side and the piece of that, that person's um, treatment, if you will. And then we have a coupling of medication management, if that is a route that the client would like to take. Everyone does not have to take that or even stay on medications lifelong. That's gonna be based on what you feel as a client. So it's about your choice. You know, you should have an active decision in what you ultimately accept. What, you know, when um, there is different types of treatment that are then offered. Um, but yeah, the opportunities are there. Um, so there are different types of even licensures. Um, and you could look at um, the board's website as well to really gain a sense of what's all out there. Okay. It sounds like a whole bunch of diligence. Like you have got to do your, your, diligent, your due diligence when it comes to what's my next step after I graduate. So yeah. like, how, how did you choose Bowie State for your grad? experience um research really um one thing that i will encourage is to look at the institution to ensure that they are k-crep because um and that's a certification that the institution will need to have in order to make your application process toward licensure a little bit more seamlessly if you will um because that is something that they will look at or require an extra piece of information if the school was not k-crep um, kind of certified, if you will, at the time of graduation. So keep that in mind. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spell it out. I'm going to have you verify it, but I'm going to spell it out. R-E-P. Okay, good. We're going to post it on our Instagram as a clip. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but seriously, those are the technical things, the technical terms that we like to emphasize when we have these conversations with pros. Um, because, you know, if you don't if you don't know someone in it or you don't get to know your professor or your your academic advisor it's pretty tough to navigate those things by yourself yeah. you know you're 20 21 22 years old and it's just like you're really about to set the tone for the next 10 to 15 years of how you're going to progress into this professional so yeah. it's those little little technical nuances that that should be elaborated so thank you for that Absolutely. And it's it's interesting that you said that because even clinicians now that are entering into licensure, we develop, you know, kind of uh, islands, if you will. So we come together and offer different types of resources and also a mentoring um, component as well, because there are clinicians that, that were in an LG, which is the initial um, graduate license that you obtain that I support and help them with like their application process. So we have this mentoring, you know, component and a sisterhood or brotherhood that's been developed because you're making different connections and we want to see everyone mature and grow in the areas that they desire. I have to ask you, this is kind of like coming to the top of my head because every time I have uh, like a troubled moment in my life, Sequita always tells me, go outside, put your feet on the ground, 
be barefoot and just be centered with the universe. Like have this sun, like you said earlier, just have the sun hit your skin. We're laughing about it because it, it sounds out of our element, but that's exactly what it is. It's out of our element. And it's always some type of nature thing that you incorporate. Um, you even worked as a vet, like in, in a, a, a veterinarians <laughs> and you incorporate animals into therapy and just being a human like we have to understand how to be human so that's what you're contributing so <laughs> if you want to talk about your your veterinary experience that's fine because it's a part of your journey <laughs> you know I just think that we're all connected right every part of, of what we're connected to or anything we touch anything we think of there's a sense of connectivity that's established right that's why it's important for us to, in essence, think happy, like we think back on, is it um, Peter Pan who's thinking happy thoughts? Is it Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you think yeah. that, you know, the happy thoughts, you know, that encouraged him to then fly or it allowed him to then be able to fly, right? So we think about how our thoughts, you know, create so much for us, right? And if it's negative thinking, our mood's been impacted, we're feeling depleted, fatigued, we're not feeling up to doing anything really or motivated, right? But if our thoughts are more positive, we really experience things in life in a very different way and most often a more positive way, right? And we think of nature, we think about, you know, even animals. Um, and I think one of the things that I was really incorporating into my practice, if we think about the idea of social, emotional support of animals, and even, you know, working with kids with like autism diagnoses and how they benefit from animal therapy, right? So there's mm -hmm. several different ways of connecting the components of animals into practice, um, but, Yes, I think you hit the nail on the head when it comes to <laughs> nature. <laughs> we we went to, uh, I think we were in Miami one time and somebody had this huge snake and I was like, oh my God, please. And I'm all like, yeah, put it on me. Put it on my shoulders. <laughs> you were like, what? You want to take a picture, you can. You weren't even there for the picture. You just wanted to be there with the snake. But I'm just like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> but no, seriously, and like when we go to the beach and we have those moments, we're just connecting with the sand, you know, and the water. It's people underestimate the power of nature. So I just I, I appreciate that advice when you give it, you know, even if it's repetitive, like just go outside, Anita, get yeah. some sun. <laughs> yeah, because you think of core beliefs and values, right? And it's like depending on what your exposure to life is, we have things that are kind of ingrained in us. But if we want to see that change, repetition is important because it allows us to get used to something that's very different or that goes against what we've been taught, right, as, as children. Yeah. Even. I just, I really um, appreciate the fact that you have put your love for, for God and how God has created us yes. and incorporated that into a very worldly um, profession, you know, as we study social behaviors and social norms. And synergizing the two, you know, is, is no easy task. No. You no. Know, I remember being back in Mr. Stanzak's class, and that was my first public school experience uh, those last two years of high school. And I remember talking about evolution for the first time because I went to a Christian school. We didn't talk about evolution. We talked about creation, right? Um, and I just... I'm just saying that I admire, I just want to put that out there. I admire the fact that as a woman of God, you've mastered this profession and studying the human mind with those worldly perspectives, but you also know who your creator is, who our creator is. No doubt, no doubt about it. Um, I think what's important when it comes to interacting with others is to create what I call a judge-free safe zone, right? Because someone else's views may, may very well differ from mine, right? But therapy, when I'm the clinician, when I'm on the side of a, you know, of the therapist, because I also seek therapy as a therapist, it's important to have that balance, right? It's not a one-sided, you know, dynamic, if you will, or we're not limited just to being on one side, right? Um, but even if someone's views differ from mine, that's something to learn, right? Or to agree to disagree, right? That's fine. It's okay, right? And that's the the environment that I think is then more beautiful because we learn and we appreciate the views and perspectives of others. If they are then seeking change, that's when we insert ourselves to offer mm -hmm. suggestions, offer let, offer advice, or to in essence create what I would call an experiment. Let's try it out, right? Nothing will change unless you attempt 
to prompt the idea or notion of change, right? Yeah. Yeah, girl. <laughs> it's been a little deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, before we close, so I, I always ask these two questions for my guests. Um, and you kind of touched on it. So okay. I'm going to have you touch on it again, but just a little bit more emphasis. But uh, the first question is, what is something that you feel as though should have been taught in high school? Mm, really just about the steps that you would need to take in order to really, really carry out the idea of, of the career path that you're seeking. Um, something and that's no matter what career you're trying to get into. No matter okay. what career, you know, really even thinking about, so, you know, typically when you're a child, you're like, oh, I want to be this, or I want to be that, right? So once that's been identified, I think it would be important to also think about implementation. What do you typically do as an adult? You know, we think about financial literacy. We talk about um, even when it comes to student loans, you know, try to go to school debt free, right? That the conversations are not being had, right? So I think that component alone, because otherwise you get into a career field and then you're left with all the debt. So you're not really being able to then have this Zen experience that you perhaps want to create because you have all these external stressors, right? So I think the financial piece is very important as well. Mm -hmm. I can't add anything to that. Thank you. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, and the second question is, what would you tell your freshman year self? Oh, I love that question. That's a very powerful question. <laughs> Um, oh, and mind you, I was there your freshman year. I was you were. So you can't, <laughs> can't sugarcoat, can't sugarcoat this. Well, you know, I think I would just go back and tell her that despite there being this linear, initial linear view of life, right? Because that, that young girl didn't have a whole lot of exposure. I think that was the start of her exposure. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think with that, I would just tell her not to limit herself, right? Um, that it is important to um, allow for yourself to then shine in the way that you would like, right? Because we talk about meekness and being humble when it comes to our uh, spirituality, right? Our, our faith base. Um, but it's okay to um, kind of illuminate what, what God is, right? Because he's working through us, he's operating through us and he made us in his image for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. So not to hide, right? Not to close yourself off from opportunities or the possibility because that, that young girl was pretty shy. And um, I think through, through life, of course, I'm totally different than she, she was, um, but she's still a you know, part of me and I still hold her near and dear. But I think that's something I would like to have been able to share with her um, and to also say, don't apply for any student loans, girl. <laughs> on that note, we're going, to do an episode, we're going to do another episode on that one. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's, yeah, student loans really just. I know, throw them in the trash. You know? Yeah, it, it's like they really just make you think about what you could, like you were saying, what you could be doing to prepare yourself for yeah. that. Yeah. And that takes a village. It's not just on you, like, yeah. because you're 18, literally about to make a decision that's yeah. going to put you at least $100,000 behind if you're getting grad degrees, especially in a very technical field like yours. So, geez, yeah. that's a and whole thing I, I do want to add. Thank you. Because it allows for the conversation to be had because. As a first time, you know, person in my family going off to college, everything was brand new. I didn't have, you know, any guidance for that matter. We were just kind of feeling and, and moving, right? Because it was new to all of us. So it's no one to, in essence, blame. It's just the fact yeah. of saying, hey, I think now the need is, now, you know, recognized. So you're the person creating, you know, the platform or the, the space even to have these types of conversations. So I applaud you, ma'am. Very, very good. <laughs> well, look, look at you closing the show out. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even do anything else. Thank you so well. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. No, seriously, I appreciate this. And and um, we're never we're never this. Uh, this is oh, okay. I'll say it like this. This is the most serious we've ever had a conversation. Like, trust me, <laughs> it's real. It's authentic. You're getting the authentic. Love. Energy. 
Wow. But I'm telling you, this is probably the least out. amount of times we giggled through a conversation since I've met you. But thank you for keeping it. Yeah, absolutely. So we are professional women, and there's a time and a place to cut up, right? <laughs> I love it. But thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Yes, of course. Anytime. Let me know. Thanks. <laughs>